Welcome to our ongoing series of videos on columns. This is from chapter three, chapter five, section three, sizing steel columns. And this is our first video in the subject area, which is video A, dealing with the methodology. When we talked about materials, we learned that there were two really profoundly important um, material properties. Um, and we understood these things in terms of this so-called stress-strain diagram. We're on the vertical axis. We're measuring stress that's applied to a sample. And on the horizontal, we're measuring the fractional deformation for which the technical word is strain. Although we're going to try and focus on using the term fractional deformation. So for example, we have concrete and wood down here. Here is 35 KSI steel, aluminum rather, and 50 KSI steel. So in the case of this steel, the two important properties are, one, that it yields at 50 KSI, kips per square inch. If we're sizing something in tension, um, that yield stress is the only thing that we need to know. If we're sizing something in compression, that's really fat and sturdy and stable, then the yield stress also is all that we need to know. But there's another property that we need for design, which is called the stiffness of the material. So when we apply stress to the steel sample, it moves along this curve, meaning that at this stress level, we have this much strain or fractional deformation in the sample. The uh, steeper this curve is, the stiffer the material is, because to produce a given level of strain, we need high levels of stress. So keep in mind, this is in kips per square inch of cross-section of the material. So if we go look at a strain of point 001. This, by the way, is a change in length of one part in a thousand. In order to achieve that in steel, we need 29,000 kips per square inch. In order to achieve it in aluminum, we need a little over 10,000. So the ratio of those two is about three to one. In other words, the stiffness of this steel is about three times the stiffness of that aluminum. That's on a per square inch basis. Keep in mind that steel is about three times as dense as aluminum. So when we go back and make comparisons on a per pound basis, the stiffness of the two materials is quite comparable. Now, when we design steel beams, we design them for a certain strength to not exceed the yield stress of 50 KSI under full factored load. But we also have to design those beams to meet certain stiffness criteria, which in some instances simply has to do with people's perceptions of the amount of movement in floors. There's a tendency to say, Oh, the really important thing is the yield stress because that's what determines whether the beam collapses or not. On the other hand, uh, people expect certain levels of performance from a stiffness point of view. And if you have a lot of unhappy clients because you haven't accounted properly for stiffness, then you're going to be in trouble in terms of your design practice. So in the end, to do a good building that people like, it's going to have to meet strength criteria in terms of yield stress, and it's going to have to meet stiffness criteria, which, or, uh, which relates to the stiffness of the material. So you might as well say you're going to deal with both those things, and you're going to deal with them in whatever order makes the design process as efficient as possible. For most of your careers, I will make the bet 
that more often than not, the design of the structural elements in your building will be governed by stiffness issues more than strength. There are exceptions, of course, but generally that's the rule. So get used to the idea that the steepness of this slope is every bit as important as that yield stress right there in terms of its influence on your design process. <clears throat> now we just mentioned in the case of beams that there is this perceptual issue having to do with the movement of the floor and that's where the stiffness comes in. In the case of columns, stiffness becomes more of a life and death matter, matter in the following way. We can have short fat columns that are heavily loaded that fail by yielding of the material and we can have tall slender columns which uh, exhibit a behavior called elastic instability and that elastic instability is governed totally by the stiffness of the material. So this is an abrupt sudden failure moment mode where the column begins to move laterally suddenly and abruptly and basically just gets out from underneath the load. We call this phenomenon elastic instability because long before we get to the yield stress of the material the column begins to abruptly uh, and catastrophically change shape. And it's called elastic instability because that instability sets in while the material is still well within the elastic range and there's no yielding of the material. Elastic instability, by the way, also goes by the name of buckling. We have bending in beams. We have buckling in columns. Bending is a gradual thing. You add loads, you get more bending in a beam. Um, <clears throat> buckling in a column is an abrupt thing. You add load, you add load, and then suddenly, abruptly, without warning, and with no self-limiting mechanism, the structure begins to buckle laterally <clears throat> or move sideways to get out from underneath the load. Um, buckling and bending are both seven-letter words that begin with B and end in ING. And one of the most common mistakes that students make is to be careless in the use of those terms. So I urge you, if you don't want to embarrass yourself in a conversation with your engineer, know the difference between buckling and bending. They are not interchangeable words. They have very specific meanings, which we will help to sharpen and refine as we go along. But get in your head right now that you can't just carelessly use one of those as a substitute for the other. Okay, so let's talk about uh, where we might see slender columns versus fat columns. We've shown, by the way, this sort of symbolic constraint that is indicating that there's no movement of the column at the bottom, no lateral movement of the column at the top, but these elements are coming in and just supporting the column so it can rotate or tilt at that point and tilt at that point, which is why we call this a pin-pin column, which is laterally restrained. So in practice, you wouldn't build something like this, but this would be provided, the function of this lateral bracing element would be for supplied by some other element in the system. So an example of a slender pin-pin column might be one of the columns out in the middle of a big box store, like a Walmart or a Lowe's or a Home Depot, where almost always there are opaque shear walls all around, which are anchored to the ground and which uh, keep the roof diaphragm from moving laterally. And then the roof diaphragm stabilizes the tops of all the columns interior to the big box. There's nothing connecting to the tops of those columns that would inhibit this tilting behavior. 
So we say that those columns are pinned columns. Um, we might, down in the base, anchor them in some concrete, but even there it's rare that that concrete is thick enough or strong enough to provide any real restraint. So we end up with pinned, pinned columns. In the case of a big box, it's just supporting the weight from part of the roof. It's a fairly tall column, might be 24 or 25 feet tall. And so we would have, that would become an example of a slender pin-pin column. An example of a fat pin-pin column might be one of the interior columns from the World Trade Center. The World Trade Center doesn't have an opaque shear wall around the, did not have an opaque shear wall around the boundary, but it did have a very dense, rigid frame which behaved like a shear wall. So the World Trade Center was a tube. Basically, all this rigid frame material created a tube that kept one floor from moving laterally relative to the floor below. In other words, there's, that means every floor is restraining these interior columns at the level of the floor. By the time we get down to the bottom of this building, where there are roughly a hundred stories of load above, the column becomes effectively very fat. Its vertical dimension between brace points, in other words, between floors, might be on the order of 14 or 15 feet. On the other hand, the column itself was almost three feet by three feet in its dimensions. In other words, it's a huge column, a fat column that's not very long. You could think of a big box store basically as one floor of the World Trade Center. It's like the top floor of the World Trade Center where there are only roof loads on the columns. And at the top floor of the World Trade Center, the columns and the interior of the building were very slender. It's pretty amazing. We typically think of buildings like this as having a core, and we often use the word core to mean structural as well as a core that contains elevators and stairs and so forth. Uh, in the case of the World Trade Center though, that core is not part of the lateral stabilization of the building. All the lateral stabilization was done with this external tube, and these columns were simply vertical braced columns running the full height of the building. Okay, so let's talk about what governs, what material properties govern the failure of these columns. If we have a short fat column with a very large force on it, the material tends to pancake out. And pancake material is the perfect analogy. You press down on it, it squishes out it undergoes plastic flow. You can do that in steel as well as dough. It just takes immensely higher forces in order to make it happen. The governing material property is the yield stress of the material. That is the determining factor in how much load that column can take. A really slender column exhibits a completely different behavior it undergoes this lateral buckling, this elastic instability, and the formula for the critical failure stress for the slender column is this strange looking thing, pi squared times E, where E is the stiffness of the material, divided by a ratio, L over R squared, where L is the length of the column, and R is called the radius of gyration, and we'll talk about it further in a moment. But this ratio right here represents the slenderness. And this number, this factor right here is absolutely crucial. It's the stiffness of the material. And you'll notice the yield stress does not appear anywhere in this equation. In other words, all the grades of steel are going to have the same stiffness E. They're going to have different yield stresses, but what this formula says is 
it doesn't make any difference what grade of steel it is. It doesn't make any difference what the yield stress is. It's going to be governed by the stiffness of the material, period. So if you ever doubt that somehow stiffness is important, look at this formula and remember that most of your life, most of your columns are going to be governed by this elastic instability. They're not going to be like this super fat column at the bottom of the World Trade Center. They're going to be this problem, and this is the material property that's going to govern the performance of those columns. So get in your mind that material stiffness is a tremendously important property. Okay, let's look at this ratio L over R again. R we call the radius of gyration. It is, in words, the effective average distance of the material in the cross section away from the neutral axis about which buckling is occurring. That's a really a mouthful of words. Um, and I'm going to translate it for you into common language. R is the effective breadth of the column. The larger R is, the fatter the column is. The larger L is, which is the length of the column, the more slender the column is. The ratio L over R we call the slenderness ratio. It's the height of the column over the breadth of the column. It's all very practical, logical, straightforward terminology. So the slenderness ratio is L over R. In the denominator, it appears to the square. Now, the question is, where did all this come from? It came from a lot of experimentation, but it also came from a brilliant piece of mathematical work done by a German mathematician named Euler. And this is referred to as Euler's equation. And I encountered this for the first time in about the sixth semester of calculus. So it's pretty esoteric mathematics. And things like this pi squared, they come out of that mathematics and there's no way that you could logically deduce them. But sort of common sense, everything else in this equation makes sense. Materials that are twice as stiff are twice as strong. Materials that are very slender that slenderness ratio goes into the denominator and then we square it and that means large slenderness ratios mean low failure stresses, low critical stresses. We sometimes, by the way, instead of L, we use an expression KL where KL accounts for any kind of stiffening, for example, if the bottom of this column was embedded in some concrete um, uh, slab, that slab would provide partial restraint at the base, and that would reduce the effective length of this column. We'll get into all those issues in more detail, but for the moment, because this is a pin-pin column, by the definition of how all this evolved, KL is just equal to L. I'm only mentioning KL at this point because we're about to go into some tables that are going to list everything in terms of KL over R rather than L over R. But for our purposes, you should understand for this simple pen pinned example, KL over R and L over R are the same thing, so you don't need to worry about it. Key point though, very short fat columns are governed by the yield stress. Long slender columns are governed by material stiffness. That's a really important distinction. Okay, so focusing on steel, we're going to do a plot where we do stress on this axis and slenderness ratio on this axis. So this could be L over R or KL over R but it's in terms of inches per inch, so it's a pure number. We don't do anything beyond 200 because the steel industry says it's just not smart to be using slenderness ratios up there. 
and they don't recommend it. Um, so we're going from very, very fat at zero slenderness to a high level of slenderness at a ratio of 200. We have three grades of steel shown here, 65 KSI, 50 KSI, and 36. If we're down in this zone where we have a really fat column, the stress at that level that we can build up will be limited by 36 KSI for that grade of steel, 50 KSI for a 50 KSI steel grade, 65 KSI for a 65 KSI grade of steel. On the other hand, out in this slender zone, if we plot Euler's equation, pi squared E divided by L over R, we get a curve that looks like this. And basically, you'll notice we haven't continued this yield out here because you can never get to that. If you have a column that's this slender and you start to add stress, it fails at that point right there. It can't get up in any way to this yield stress because elastic instability limits you. And elastic instability can be a pretty serious issue. If you have a 36 KSI column, but you're out at a slenderness ratio like 150, your inherent capacity based on yield is way up here, but it's actually buckling way down there. In other words, buckling can be a very severe limitation on the capacity of a column. Okay, now this is what we call theoretical behavior. We've drawn the, as if yield stress governs all the way to there, and then it's pure Euler buckling from there. The reality is not quite so simple. This is the yield stress. This is the Euler curve. The actual curve looks something like this. So in other words, we have essentially pure yielding here. We have pure buckling here. And then everywhere in between, we have what we call intermediate behavior. Now, the equations for each of these curves are unbelievably complex. And they take up about a half a page of fairly fine text. Fortunately for us, there are only a few standard grades of material. And so the digital data, or excuse me, the tabular data that's necessary to generate these curves is all generated in tabular form so that we don't have to worry about doing all that mathematics. And that tabular data looks something like this. And here we have slenderness ratio. And then we have in this table, four sets of data, 35 KSI steel, which is what we have for pipe, 42 KSI, which is what we have for hollow steel sections round, 46 KSI, which is what we have for hollow steel sections squared. And then finally, 50 KSI is our most common stress grade for wide flanges, which also includes angles and channels and things of that sort. So we're going to go in and we're going to zoom in on this part of this uh, chart. And this is what it looks like. So if we have a really fat slender column, has zero slenderness, our failure stress or critical stress is going to be taken as whatever the yield stress is of the material. 35 KSI for pipe, 42 for hollow steel sections round, 46 for hollow steel sections squared, and finally uh, 50 is the most common grade for steel wide flanges. So here we go, slenderness ratio getting larger and down near the bottom of this page. Uh, it goes down to 66 and then it starts up here at 67 and begins over again. And here we have the yield stresses beginning at the highest possible level for zero slenderness or in other words, super fat columns and diminishing downward as we increase the slenderness ratio.
When we get down here at around 122, when we look at all of these values, it turns out that, um, not sure this is even right anymore. Somewhere in the neighborhood of that, the variation across here is like 2%. It's really minor. When we go back here, the variation is the full range of yield stress values. But when we get into the serious buckling zone, all these materials are behaving essentially the same. So for example, right here at 120, let's take 125 for the moment. I think these numbers have gotten shifted off. This is 16.065. That's the same. That's the same. So we have to go way down to 35 KSI steel before we see even a slight difference between that value and that value. And even then, it's only about 2%. Okay. <coughs> now, this, this chart, by the way, these tables can be applied to any steel column we might want to create. Um, one of the beauties to steel, though, is that because of the tooling cost, there are a limited number of sort of standard shapes. And so we're going to learn how we can pre-process uh, information for those standard shapes to provide really easy to use design tables that allow us to figure out the appropriate column that we need for any given situation. So. In order to do that, we're going to start with a standard weight, nominal 4-inch steel pipe column with an effective length of 14 feet. Um, by the way, steel pipe was invented for plumbing purposes. The wall thickness is a certain percentage of the overall diameter which was set that way to resist water pressure inside. Steel pipe is one of our lowest grade structural materials, but it is also the cheapest kind of closed section that we can get. And in spite of the fact that it wasn't optimized for column applications, we find extensive use for it. And it's a very economical system. So we're going to begin by looking at steel pipe 4 inches. So the slenderest ratio is the effective length over the effective breadth. And we've been told that the effective length is 14. So we can just plug that number in. Now the question is, where do we get R, the effective breadth? Well, you can get that under the materials chapter in chapter four, or it also gets repeated in chapter five in the column tables. So we're going to go look that up. But while we're there, we're also going to look up another number, which is the cross-sectional area of the tube, because there are two important factors in determining the strength of this pipe. One is how much material is in it, but also how is that material distributed? R is the crucial information about how the material is distributed in the cross section. A is the indicator of what is the total amount of material. So we're going to go to the next slide, which comes from chapter five. It's column data. And this is what it looks like. And across the top here, you'll see pipe 12, pipe 10, pipe eight, six, five, four, and so forth. And we're going to blow up one of those. And this, by the way, this table gives design strength in axial compression. That's the primary purpose of this table. But for right now, we're interested in understanding how this table was created and what its meaning is. And we're also interested in finding these values of R, the radius of gyration or effective breadth of the column, and the cross-sectional area of the column. And we want it for the standard four inch pipe. 
And so we're going to go down to the bottom of this page. So notice this double line here. When we go down to the bottom of the page, we see the gross area for the section is 3.17 inches squared, and R is 1.51 inches. So armed with that information, we're now going to go plug 1.51 inches in for R, and then we do our simple conversion factor, and we end up with this pure number as the slenderness ratio. It's 111.3. Now we're going to go to the tables and try and look up what the allowed or critical stress is. So we're trying to get at critical stress from the tables for 111.3 slenderness ratio. And this is what the tables look like. And I'm going to see if we can, I hope this is visible. Here we have 111 and 112, and we're looking at 35 KSI steel. So we're going to go down here and we're going to interpolate between 18.629 and 18.418, which are the critical stress or the failure stress for the slenderness ratios of 111 and 112. So we're going to interpolate between 18.418 and 18.629. And when we go do that, we're going to end up with 18.57 kips per square inch. And now we're going to go get the failure force, which is the failure stress or critical stress, times the area. So we put 18.57 times the area, which we looked up before, which was 3.17 inches squared. And we end up with this as the predicted failure force for this 14 foot long standard nominal four inch steel pipe. Now we have to reduce that to get the design strength in axial compression we reduce it by the so-called phi factor, which is our uncertainty or our safety margin associated with our uncertainty having to do with the reliability of the column. And for steel columns, that's 0.85. When we multiply it times that, we get 50.03 kips as the design axial strength in compression for this 14 foot long column. And now when we go back to this table and we scan down for the four inch pipe, standard weight, 14 inch, we scan across and we got 50.0. That is the design strength in axial compression for this column. Now, now you understand how this number was generated, we just derived that number right there for this table. The steel people were nice enough to derive that number for all these pipes up here and for all the effective lengths over on this side. So once we know the effective length, and we want to size for a certain column. So for example, if the effective length is 14, we can scan across here looking for the lightest section, which supports the axial force that we need to design for. That ends our video on the methodology for sizing steel columns.